Hello everyone, Chris Paris here, the Earl of Endocrine, and welcome to our endocrine chapter of our internal medicine section. So now we're gonna start with delving into the wonderful world of hormones, hormones. So a lot of what I do guys, you know, I'm doing the endocrine thing now for about, I don't know, almost 10 years. And a lot of what I do for a living is based on basic science. So if you understand the basic science and the, the whole axes and mechanisms, which you all, I'm, I know you all love, I know you all remember that from your basic science days, right back in medical school. But nonetheless, if you understand your basic science, you'll understand most of endocrine. All of the special testing that I do, the stimulations, the suppressions, all the special testing that I do for a living are all based on endocrine phys. So we'll do a quick review of the axes, and then boom, we'll discuss the diseases, all right? So if you remember, the pituitary is divided into two parts, the anterior and the posterior, right? The overwhelming majority of hormones come from the anterior pituitary. And on the anterior pituitary gland, the anterior pituitary gland, who's the boss? Who tells them what to do? So it's kind of like a household, right? So who's the boss of the household? The wife, right? The wife tells the husband what to do. So who's the, so who's the wife? The wife is the hypothalamus, right? That's where everything starts, the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is the wife, it's the boss, right? And the hypothalamus tells this guy what to do. The hypothalamus tells, tells, tells this guy what to do, through what? Through releasing factors, right? Corticotropin releasing factor, thyrotropin releasing factor, growth hormone releasing hormone, releasing factors, right? Releasing factors. And then the anterior pituitary goes on and tells what are called the target glands, the target glands what to do. Like I said, honey, take out the garbage. Wifey, right? Honey, take out the garbage. Yeah, baby, I got it. And then what does, what does hubby do? Hubby goes, yo, junior, kid, yo, junior, take out the garbage, right? Exactly, that's how it goes, right? So now wifey's telling hubby what to do, and who's the junior? The target glands. Who are the target glands of the anterior pituitary, famously? You guys know this, right? The thyroid, the adrenal gland, right? <clears throat> the gonads, like testes and ovaries. The axis is parallel, different obviously, but parallel in men and women, right? What else we have? We have the growth hormone axis, which we'll discuss is a little different. We also have the prolactin axis, which is a little different, all right? So in general, this is the order of sequence, the sequence of events. Hypothalamus tells the anterior pituitary what to do through releasing hormones, releasing factors. And then the anterior pituitary tells the target glands what to do through stimulatory hormones, such as TSH, ACTH, LH, FSH, GH itself, and prolactin itself. Right? Very good. With me so far? Excellent. Honey, take out the garbage. You got it, baby. Junior, take out the garbage. Okay, Dad. Junior goes out, brings out the garbage, comes back in the house. Dad, I took out the garbage. Fantastic. Baby, I took out the garbage. Right? And now wifey's happy, and hopefully she'll be nice to Daddy. All right? So therefore, how, how, does, uh, how does wifey, mommy know that the garbage was taken out? Feedback inhibition, right? So what happens? Thyroid makes T4 and T3 which then goes back and inhibits TSH. Also inhibits the hypothalamus too, guys. Feed, feedback inhibition goes both ways. It goes both levels, I should say. The anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus, right? The adrenals make cortisol, as well as all of the other adrenal hormones. Goes back, feedback inhibition. Well, look at that, you see, you're making me drop my markers. Okay, right? So t testes and ovaries make the sex hormones, right? Testosterone, Estrogen, testosterone and estrogen goes back, inhibits, etc., etc., etc. Feedback inhibition, and therefore you have your balance and your axes. Whenever we do special testing, like stimulations and suppressions, what we're really doing is challenging this axis. That's all we're doing. That's it. When you have a disease of overproduction, what, what's the problem? You're making too much of one of these. If you have a disease of deficiency, you're making too little. That's it, that's all it is, folks. Now we do have some exceptions to this. This is the general order of things in the hypothalamic pituitary axis, but you do have some exceptions. Exception number one, the growth hormone axis. 
the GH axis over here, over here, is a little unique. And how is it unique? Growth hormone does not stimulate a direct target gland, but rather, if you remember, it stimulates an organ, the liver, right? And the liver then produces the workhorse of the growth hormone axis, which is what, who remembers, who remembers? Insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1. And IGF-1 is the one that's responsible for most of the growth, for cartilage, bones, ligaments, muscles, all of the growth. It's primarily IGF-1. GH does very little, if any, work. IGF-1 does most of the work. IGF-1 is then the one that goes and feedback inhibits GH, all right? In addition to this, growth hormone's also unique in that it has its own inhibitor, its own physiologic inhibitor, where the others do not, almost. And that inhibitor is known as somatostatin, right? Somatostatin, SSA for short. Somatostatin is a natural inhibitor of GH and GR, GHRH produced in the pancreas, right? Growth hormone axis is the only axis that has that. Now, somatostatin does work and inhibit many, many other hormones, many, which many of us know, but its initial physiologic target is the growth hormone axis. So that's why GH is significant and unique. The other unique axis is the prolactin axis. Now, why is prolactin unique? Well, what does prolactin, what target gland does prolactin stimulate for target hormone production? None. Prolactin is a, a stimulatory hormone and a target hormone in itself, right? Because prolactin goes to breast tissue and directly stimulates milk production. So therefore, there is no prolactin and then prolactin secondary hormone. It's not like TSH and then free T4. No, no, no. Prolactin is on its own. Goes to breast tissue, that's it. Stimulates milk production. But prolactin is unique. So let me ask you guys a question. What is the hypothalamic releasing factor for prolactin? Think hard. Think hard. What is the hypothalamic releasing factor? You know why you guys are having a hard time answer the que answering the question? Because there is none. Prolactin is unique, it's a red herring, right? It sticks out from the rest because prolactin is the only anterior pituitary hormone that's under what's called tonic inhibition. It's turned off tonically by something called prolactin inhibitory factor, PIF, also famously known as dopamine. So dopamine naturally inhibits prolactin and it's released by the hypothalamus. Prolactin is normally turned off. Why? Guys, think about it. Could you imagine a world of uninhibited prolactin? Hmm? We would be living in a world full of double F bras and milk everywhere, okay? So nature keeps prolactin turned off. <laughs> but jokes aside, there's actually a reason why. Because creating milk is very expensive for, for the woman, for mom. It is. For every, ladies, for every sitting of, uh, of nursing or breastfeeding for the baby, you know how many calories you lose? Three to 500 calories per sitting. Wow. What's the quickest way to lose post-pregnancy weight? Breastfeed. It's true. So creating milk is very expensive for mom nutritionally. Calories, nutrients, proteins, fats, vitamins, minerals, etc. It's very expensive. So nature says, I cannot waste mom's resources if she's not feeding a baby. Now the signal which tells breast tissue and the hypothalamus, we're having a baby, get the cigars out, is estrogen. But until that signal comes along, prolactin's turned off by dopamine. Off. All right, so it's very important to understand. It makes the prolactin access extremely unique. Extremely, all right? So this is the anterior pituitary axis, right? It's the anterior pituitary. Now, the anterior pituitary is the famous one. We all know it, right? It's the, it's the, it's the pretty girl on the beach. It's the you know, Sports Illustrated swimsuit model. Because I make TSH, I make ACTH. What do you do? Everyone forgets about the poor guy in the back. The posterior pituitary. Everyone forgets about the poor posterior pituitary. The redheaded stepchild, right? The posterior pituitary. But the posterior pituitary is very important. It makes two major hormones. What major hormones does it make? Ah, trick question. It doesn't make any. It stores. The posterior hormones are created in the hypothalamic nuclei. Supraoptic nucleus, paraventricular nucleus, etc. They're stored in the posterior side. Very important. Don't get that confused. But the two hormones that the posterior releases, which is important to understand, is of course, Vasopressin, also known as antidiuretic hormone, ADH, 
which is the one that we really care about clinically. And the other is oxytocin. Now, oxytocin is the hormone responsible for assisting in uterine contractions at the time of the baby coming uh, for delivery. But the fact is, you know, to this day, no one's exactly sure what exact, exactly what oxytocin does. To this day, people are, we still don't know. You know that? We know it's associated with the uterine contractility, but the biggest, most potent stimulant of uterine contractility is the drop in progesterone. It's not oxytocin. Not to mention the fact that every woman in labor, any moms watching this, know that you're going to get oxytocin support regardless. So the role of oxytocin is not very clear. Clinically, not very relevant. The one that we care about is this guy, vasopressin. Very relevant, right? Because if you remember this guy, this is the guy that goes to the collecting duct, the collecting duct in the distal nephron and upregulates via the V2 receptor, upregulates aquaporins. And I know you guys may th be thinking I'm going a little too basic science-y, but this is very important because aquaporins are how what enters the collecting duct? Free water. So vasopressin is directly responsible for free water reabsorption. Free water reabsorption. If this axis is damaged, you cannot reabsorb free water for whatever reason. And when you're assessing the disease called diabetes insipidus, and you do a special test called a water deprivation, you're challenging this. So it's important, like I said guys, endocrine is extremely physiology based. So if you understand this stuff, you'll get the diseases. All right, this is a basic pituitary overview, quick review, and now we're gonna get to the diseases. See you in a minute.